Welcome back to another episode of Sales Gravy. I'm with the art of charm today, AJ and Johnny. Before we get started, this podcast is sponsored by Vidyard. Vidyard is the most fantastic way to connect with your prospects. If you're having a hard time getting in, just go to Vidyard, shoot a short video, send it through the Vidyard app, and voila, your prospect will respond to you. I love Vidyard. I use it every single day. If you want to get a free account on Vidyard, just go to vidyard.salesgravy.com. That's vidyard.salesgravy.com, and you'll see exactly why we love this app. AJ and Johnny, The Art of Charm. Man, I have listened to your podcast so much, so many times, and I told you the last time we were together that I feel like I'm a little bit too old for your age group. But it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating podcast. The conversations that you have are incredible, and I love the art of influence, the art of persuasion, the art of connecting with other human beings. So this conversation is going to roam just a little bit because I've got so much to ask you because I have, it's just so rare that I get superstars like you on. In fact, I told somebody, I, mean, I was on the Art of Charm podcast and like, oh my God, that's a big one. So that was fantastic. Here's the question I have for you. What is charm? Like you talk about the art of charm. Walk me through what you mean by charm. So charm is how you make people feel after you leave the room. So many of us are so concerned about first impressions, concerned about ourselves, the way people perceive us. It's about having a lasting impact and being that magnetic presence in people's lives. And, you know, we started this journey almost 15 years ago. Charm to us really meant with the opposite sex and romance and how to bring more options into our life. But as we've grown as leaders of the art of charm, the show has grown. We now realize when it comes to powerful communication, how do you stand out in a sea of noise? And that's really what we enjoyed chatting with you about when you came on our show. And we believe it's what's said behind your back when you leave the room that determines how charming you are. And I think there's three pillars that hold that up. And number one is charisma. And it, the charisma is your ability to attract people and opportunities into your life rather than repel them or chase them, which will repel them. It is your persuasion skills, being able to win people over to your argument, to your worldview. And lastly, your ability to lead those people and them seeing you as a leader, as somebody that they can put trust in. And we believe if you nail those three things, people will be talking about you after you leave. You will leave uh, with them having a burnt picture and memory of you in them. And that's what, that's what the show is about. And that's why it encompasses so many different fields. You mentioned yourself and that as a salesman, you've gotten a lot out of that show. And we like to feel that our show is great for people in sales. We also like to think that our show is incredible for those who are looking to get better at dating and put themselves out there and enjoy that process of connecting with people. And then lastly, for people in, in, a, in a professional setting or being an entrepreneur, to be able to lead their teams, to, to make of it what they will and to get people on board. So, I, you know, first of all, I think you're exactly right. The art of charm is fascinating for me, even though I've been married for 30 years and I'm, I'm not, I'm not even, you know, there's no possibility that I'm ever dating anybody ever again in my life, but it, it does make you want to go back and like, think about what you did when you were younger and how you might've done things differently to leave that lasting impression. You said a couple of things there that I want to break down. One of the things you, you, you said is the word chase and one thing that I've, I've noticed about human beings is that human beings have a funny way of running from things that chase them. And this happens a lot in sales where the salesperson is, is in this, this like perpetual chase. And, and I call it just checking in. So it sounds like this, they go, Hey Johnny, I'm just checking in. And they, and they, and they're calling, 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 and they're doing all the work and the other person is running from them. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about chasing. I got, there's a bunch that you said, I'm coming back to a lot of this, but AJ, let's talk about this concept of, of how people chase people away from them. And, and that's one impression that they leave. Well, I think a big part of this is what we define as value. So what we teach is value at the Art of Charm is attention, appreciation, and acceptance. And as humans, we are either giving those things to others or we are chasing those things from others. And in your example, as a salesperson, 
Well, we're chasing that potential lead's attention. We want to be top of mind. So when they go to make that decision, they think of us, they purchase. The problem, as you said, is that as humans, when we are chased, we run faster away from what's chasing us. It's hardwired into our DNA. So what we focus on is giving people that value, not chasing it from others. So how can you give attention in a meaningful way? Well, as a salesperson, you could be fully engaged in that sales conversation. And as we talked about on our episode, listening beyond just the initial emotions, but getting below the iceberg, see what's really going on with that person. You can appreciate someone. So instead of waiting for them to compliment you, you can compliment them. And we were teasing you earlier about how flattering you are every time we chat. But that's just it. You're giving appreciation to others, not looking to take it from others. And then the third is acceptance, which is inviting people into your life. If we are chasing those three things, we are at the art of charm, what we call low value. So every action that we have is either moving towards getting those from others, or it's actually just giving those to others. And when we give those things to others, instead of chasing them, we turn on that reciprocity where people naturally feel like, wow, AJ was so great in conversation, gave me so much attention, now I have to pay attention to him. I have to give him a compliment next time I see him, right? And that, it's a subtle difference, but that really changes the way people perceive you and ultimately whether or not they wanna do business with you. I think there's always gonna be a cat and mouse game between interpersonal relationships regardless, but the context, changes if it's a sales well you have a lead where did that lead come from it just didn't pop out of the sky that lead had gotten to you because some way that person has shown or expressed interest in something that you have so you do have to reach out you do got to chase you do have to put yourself on top of mind but as we talk well you were on our show there is a process and a system to that to to be to allow people to feel enticed in that relationship rather than being pushed away in a dating context yeah for in traditional roles the guy is going to have to go out there and do his thing however we also know that the girl who was checking us out is a lead she has shown expressed interest in us we have to play this game now you could be overbearing you can be intimidating and we talk about value as aj had mentioned and how you deliver attention approval and acceptance in this interpersonal cat and mouse game is going to result in whether or not you're pulling people in or chasing them away. So you think about, you said this, AJ, we're, we're in an, in an, I say an interpersonal connection with someone relationship with someone, and we want to leave a lasting impact. That's the definition of charm. So they walk away and they say, wow, that was an amazing human being that I just met. What I've found is that the people in my life that I meet and I walk away and say, I want more of them, like I want to spend more time with them, are the people who are typically not talking. Like you're, you're, you meet them at a networking event or you go to a party. And a lot of this happens in, in my world. Like, in, it, you know, they're in the holidays. I'm at a party and I meet someone who has come to our town from someplace else. And then I meet them. And, How are you doing? What's going on? And they ask me a couple of questions and I start talking and, you know, I can't help myself because they keep asking questions and they keep wanting to know more about me, even though my brain is saying, you need to ask them a question too, but you just keep going, going. And when I walk away, I'm like, wow, they're amazing. And I'm guessing on the other side, they're walking away going, man, that dude spent the entire time talking about himself. And so we, we both had a different perspective on the conversation. But what I found is that when people listen to you, you have, you have a tendency to be more attracted to those people. And the most unattractive person to you, the person that, that, you, that you despise the most is the human being that is standing in front of you talking about themselves, which is one of the ways that you begin to push people away. So let's talk about real quickly how listening and engaging people and forgetting about you and what you want to say. Because a lot of times when you, when you hear like giving value, people hear talk at people or what I call pitch slapping, right? I just walk through the door and just tell you everything about me. How powerful listening is in, to, to, to create this, we'll call this, this, uh, this aura right around you of this is a really charming person. Well, you hit the nail on the head. When we feel heard and validated, we want to spend more time with that person. We feel deeply understood. 
The problem, and we find this in all of our prospective clients and those who come through the training, is that we all over-index on our listening skills. We all would say we're great listeners. I've never met someone who says I'm an awful listener. The problem is we don't utilize that information in a meaningful way for the other person to feel validated. They may feel heard, like, yeah, I told AJ a lot of stuff on the podcast we were on, but they didn't feel validated in that you related to them and you met them where they are. So for us, a big part of listening is not listening to figure out what we're going to say next or listening how we can interject our story or work our pitch in or get to that next question. Uh, instead, we are listening from a place of curiosity and finding moments and emotions that we can relate to. And part of listening is happening on multiple levels. So the first level, I think everyone's a great listener in, and that's just the exchange of information, the data, the facts, the location, the very specific things that we analyze. So for a salesperson, that might be where the person lives. That might be what the person's frustration is. The second level is, well, what's the emotion behind this, right? They express some data, but did they like where they grew up? Did they hate their hometown and that's why they moved? Do they enjoy their work that they do? Or do they not really do it for fun? They do it because they got to put food on the table. There's an emotional context to anything that's being communicated to us in conversation. Great listeners are able to pick up on those emotions and then relate to those emotions. And that's why when we teach our conversation formula, and this works in any context, whether it's sales, whether it's uh, networking, or on a date, we want to be listening first. So we're going to ask a question, express curiosity, and as you said, get the other person talking about themselves, which of course is everyone's favorite subject. But we have to do something with that answer other than just nod and say, cool, or yeah, that's awesome. We actually have to work to relate to that person, meet them where they are, and understand them at an emotional level. So what we teach is we ask a question, we listen to that answer, and then we relate to them in the form of a statement. What do we enjoy about that? What motion are we picking up on that? What is the meaning behind it? You practice these skills at a conversational level with everyone, you start to open up new pathways to listening and picking up on what people are saying. So ultimately, they feel great around you. They feel important. They feel appreciated. They feel like what they're saying matters. And when we feel like we're having an impact on others, well, we want to spend more time with them. So let's, I want to break this down for a second on listening because we, we teach a, a, a simple framework and I'm going to give you each piece of the framework. And, uh, and I want you all to walk me through this because I think this is incredibly important. Now, when we think about listening, we, we understand that the most insatiable human need is the need to feel like we matter. It's, to, it's to, to feel appreciated. You cannot make someone feel too loved, too appreciated, too important. It's not possible. It's insatiable. And the easiest way to make someone feel like they matter is to listen to them and demonstrate that you understand them. So if you start thinking about, you said something like, you, you're going to say, give them a statement that says, I heard your story, I got you. And if you think about the relationships in your life, the most important important relationship is the relationship with the person that you could describe this way. This person totally gets me. The get relationship is the most important because they understand you and we all want to be understood. So when we start thinking about listening, we teach a, basically a four part framework or four principles. Mm -hmm. And that is that people respond in kind. So your demeanor in the relationship is, is going to drive and that conversation is going to drive whether you're pushing people away or you're bringing them toward you. So we, we believe that like a non-complimentary behavior like relaxed assertive confidence is the behavior that's going to get people to lean in. So if you're insecure or passive, and this is especially true if you're dating, like if you show up on a date and you're insecure and you're passive, you, in, you end up being too eager, which is a disruptive emotion that will push people away. So first of all, we want, we want people to, to respond in kind to us being relaxed and confident. Next is understanding that questions control the flow of the conversation. So what I run in with people is that people have this belief that to be in control of the conversation, and a lot of, sell, a lot of salespeople in particular are control freaks, that they have to be doing all the talking. And you'll notice that. So if I'm doing the talking, then I'm in control. Then, so questions control the flow. The person asking the question is absolutely in control of where the conversation is going to go. Next principle is that people communicate in stories. Some people long stories, some people short stories, but we communicate in stories, not bullet points. 
And this is where I think people go wrong is that especially salespeople, because when someone's telling their story, like you said, AJ, I need to relate to the story. We want to relate to the story, but then we want to tell our story right on top of their story. And they don't care about our story. We do because we want to feel significant too. In order to make the other person feel significant, you listen to them, not them listening to you. So we, we want to jump in. And you said something really important. You just tell you, this is active listening. I just repeat what you said in a statement that says something like this. Wow, that sounds like it was a lot of fun. I, I, I'm, I, I, I wish I'd been there. Tell me a little bit more about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm expressing that I got this. But we have to understand that people communicate in stories and, and not cut people off. And that's where we begin to have problems. And then fourth principle is that listening builds these deep emotional connections because when you listen, you give people the greatest gift that you can give another human being. And that is to, to demonstrate to them that you care and you believe that they matter. And, and so let's just, let's talk a little bit more about those concepts and how that works into Johnny, your, you know, your frameworks and, and the way you help your clients and the people that you coach begin to build these better relationships and create, I'm so happy you said this, these impactful relationships. So when, when people walk away from you, they're like, man, I want more Johnny. Sometimes it can go the other way as well. <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> because these techniques are just so powerful and regardless of my movements, there's still an interpretation on the other side. And that interpretation has to go through those people's lived experiences. And that's going to color uh, the techniques, the tactics, the stories that I use to their own bias. But we'll get to that later we have a lot to, to cover so one of the pitfalls that is in in this framework that we're discussing is the, the human's tendency to be nervous if they're not trained for these conversations you are reduced to the level of your training and as a sales trainer i'm sure that you have drills and exercises for people to rehearse this and get this the repetitions in so that it is an an automatic response when they're under tension and pressure and let's face it sales is tension and pressure a first date is tension and pressure going up to do a presentation or a networking event where you've never met this person before there's tension and pressure which means just by the situation you are reduced to your level of training and guess what if you haven't trained you're screwed and here's why let's talk about the common pitfalls that are going to be sitting here what happens when you're reduced to your level of your training and you don't have any training, right? You're going to go with what you know. So how you've handled these situations in the past will be how you handle them moving forward. So the results that you hated before are going to continue to show up because you have not changed your training the way you're going about it. So what are the common pitfalls? What do people go back to? One of them is called the question train because what burrows in everybody's mind is this idea that people love to talk about their favorite subject themselves. So that makes the average person go, great, got it. I will just ask questions and they'll talk about themselves and we'll, they'll be vulnerable and we'll connect. It doesn't work that way. It's the connection is in the volley in the appreciation and the identifying and the validating of those statements. If I don't know you and I ask you a question, that's one question. I put pressure on you. There's already tension or pressure on the interaction. You're nice. You're a nice person. So you oblige and you answer that. And I'm, I'm like, great. He answered my question. So what am I going to do? I give you another one. And now I ask you another question. Now in our classrooms, we do video work exercises for these to let people know and see how cringy it is when you start asking question after question after question and the person who doesn't know you is all of a sudden under an interrogative light 
the tension and pressure gets built to such a degree because you haven't contributed to this conversation. You've put all the effort onto them to make this work. And you can only ask so many questions between three and four before the interaction collapses on itself. And it gets so uncomfortable that it has to break up. One of these two people are going to have to change the situation or leave. If you don't have any training in this situation, the other person feels incredibly uncomfortable. The most, the thing, the highest percentage of the result is they are going to go, I need to leave this conversation. They shut down, they close off, and they find any excuse they can to leave, which leaves you in a position of wondering what happened. Now, it's going to be very easy for you to think, that person's just mean. All I was doing was asking questions. I was trying to be nice. You weren't being nice. You were being an interrogative person. You were being intimidating. They had to leave. They were so uncomfortable. That's one result. The other result is I must suck. People must not like me because every time I start asking people questions, they leave and that's the result. Both results are from due to no training, poor training, uh, or uh, inexperience in communication. Easily rectified with sales training, our training, anyone's training to get more reps on what an incredible interaction looks like and a volley and a shared frame between two people. So it reminds me of a, a story early in my career as a salesperson. So I, my, my very first year, I, I've got this great sales manager. And he gives me three pages of questions. So I'm going out on sales calls. Here's the questions. And I literally had a clipboard. I put the questions on the clipboard, <laughs> right? And I would sit down in front of these four <laughs> prospects. And I would start at the top and go, so tell me how many of these you use. And then I would go, so tell me how many of these you use. I might even listen to what they're doing. And I'm going through the whole thing. And I'm not being very successful. So I asked my sales manager to go out with me on a sales call to watch me because I'm like, I'm not closing any business. So he goes out with me and I get my clipboard out. We sit down in front of the customer and I start interrogating them. I mean, it's no different than like the spy movies you would yeah. see where the person's sitting in a chair and there's a spy spotlight on them. And you're like, yep. where were you were last night? So I'm going through this process. We get done and we walk out into the parking mm -hmm. lot and my sales manager, and I love, he's still one of my very best friends. We walk out and he just looks at me and goes, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm answering the, I'm asking the questions you gave me. He goes, you're a moron. Stop <laughs> doing that. <laughs> so then we had to like, then he started practicing me. Okay, let's sit down and do a discovery call. Yeah. And what I learned was a trick that, that I adopted over the years is that my real job is when I walk into a conversation with someone is to ask as few questions as possible to maximize the amount of information that I get. And what a lot of people don't get is they go into a conversation and I can see in my mind exactly what you're saying is that they walk into a conversation and the first first question that they ask is a hard question for someone to answer. Now, sometimes that can be based on the, just the communication style. So you go into, say, we call it an analyzer. But if you go into an analyzer type personality and you ask them a question about their family, I mean, they're just looking at you going, I'm not answering that question. They just shut you down. They shut down. You shut down. And then for salespeople who are typically more energizer, socializer type people, like, you know, like us, like we're talking, they're like, oh, I didn't get validated. This is, you know, back to your, your, your point, AJ, but it's on the other side. Like, I didn't get validated. So then they just just start talking because that's the only way their brain can cope with the fact that the person's not responding to them. And, and in essence, they end up destroying the relationship. Johnny, everybody wants to run and they, and they feel terrible about it. But the, but you just, I think you just nailed this. Like the, the art of conversation is asking big open-ended questions that are easy for people to answer that they want to answer. Like they want to step into the question. Like if you're sitting down with a business owner, like me or like you we're entrepreneurs Ask us about how we started our business. It, you'll have a hard time getting us to shut up because we're, we feel so proud about what we've done. And the journey that we've been on is, has been something that, you know, we, we want to tell the whole world about, or like, you know, like me, ask me about how you write a book or ask you about, you know, creating the art of charm, you know, podcast, but this, this idea of repetition and, and working on this, AJ, I think is important. You call it the art of charm. And I think when we call art of anything, a lot of people think that art is something that you, like you're good at immediately. Like the, you're an artist, but I, my, my wife is a really good painter, but she wasn't always a really good painter. She wanted to paint, but she will just say this nicely. So she's not listening right now. She sucked at it. It was bad. 
but then she started taking classes. So she would do these online classes and now she does live classes. Like she's with these, these artists and they're working together, painting together and they're giving each other feedback. Johnny, you said this on like on video, but let's just think about this. Then she got better and better and better. And AJ, the other day she painted a picture and I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, like that looks like something you could put in a museum. It was that good. And now she's selling her art. So this idea that you, you, you become an artist, like you're, you're the artist of charm immediately, I think is lost on people because it's not really as much as an art. Is it's, it's really perfecting the science of it, isn't it, AJ? And, and then to other people, it looks like you've got some sort of magic that just makes you charismatic and charming and everybody wants to be around you. Is, am I right about that? Well, one thing that I want to point out, and the reason the art is so important is because there's two parts to this equation. We're part of it, and the other person is part of it. And as we talked about in our episode with you, you can have the best process in the world, but we're dealing with humans. And that yes, we can group them and we can subgroup them, but not everyone's the same. So a big part of this and a big part of being an adept conversationalist and a great listener is actually processing the information that the other person is giving you. So one thing that we teach all of our clients is that we listen with our eyes and our ears. And I'm I think, listening. and I think, by the way, you listen with your heart too. So it's eyes, that. ears, and heart. So we are filtering information through our brain, trying to process it logically, but there's an emotional context that is constantly being communicated in conversation. You might not be picking up on it. That emotion might be disinterest. It might be frustration. But that's the key, listening with your eyes. When I ask a question of someone, the first response, right, the lightning before the thunder, is going to be their face, their facial expressions. If I ask you about your family and you don't want to talk about your family, your face is going to show that first. In fact, you might not even say it with your words, I don't want to talk about it. But we're going to see in your micro expressions, your breaking of eye contact, your shifting in your seat, that, hey, this is something I don't really want to talk about. Now, a great listener is going to see that signal and go, okay, cut that thread. Let's pick up another conversational thread. Okay, doesn't want to talk about family. Let's talk about work. Let's talk about hometown. But if we're only listening to the words or we're stuck in our script or we're already thinking about what we're going to say, that's going to be this witty, snappy, get a laugh, come back or get them even more excited about us, we're missing that part of communication. And as Johnny said, the conversation is going to fall flat. So it's really important that we stop assuming we know the other person, that there's some shared experience, that we fully understand them. And we need to take that curiosity in our listening to look at what are the nonverbal expressions that are being communicated along with this person's answer. And you can even, as you become a really adept listener, and obviously a lot of people in your audience are probably doing audio-only sales calls, you can pick up on vocal tonality and the cadence and the amount of pause that people take in between responses to know whether or not they're excited to talk about this or it's a difficult <laughs> subject. So we have to work to that level of listening to get better as an artist right? And understand that the other person has a role in this and we have to read them to be able to utilize all that great science and psychology and influence and persuasion to our advantage. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a, as you learned in your first sales experience, just ask these questions, check these boxes and magically they hand you their wallet. It doesn't work that way. We have to meet them where they are. We have to understand what emotions they're feeling and not assume them. And as you said earlier, what I loved about your example was that sounds fun, right? You're not assuming it was fun for the other person, but you're relating how you would feel in that moment. Many of us are afraid to do that because it's, well, what if I guess the emotion wrong? Well, we want that information. <laughs> we don't want to be working off assumptions, especially in a sales context, because the further in that conversation you go thinking that you know, and you haven't checked in throughout the conversation, am I on the right track? Is this really what's going on? Is there something else here we haven't talked about? You work yourself to those assumptions, and then the prospect goes, this isn't the solution for me. This isn't what I was looking for. 
So we have to check in and that's where the art comes in because it's really understanding what's being communicated back to us, not just how I'm communicating. So something important that you said there specifically around sales is this idea of you hit a dead end. Like you, you're checking an assumption that you're making about what you see. I'm going to add a little context to this. These days, a lot of our calls are on video. This is on video now. We're, you and I are talking. And one of the things that science is teaching us is that we can train our peripheral vision to pick up micro expressions. So at the subconscious level, we're seeing whether or not we're making an impact or whether or not we're not. So I think this is something you have to practice. I teach people this. you got to do this over and over and over again. And just like a person, let's say a person suddenly becomes blind, all their other senses start to pick up, whether you're selling on the phone or on video. This idea, though, of testing assumptions and not making assumptions. So one of the things I see with people, a big mistake they make is you're in a conversation and you assume that you know what the other person's going to say because you assume that you have a shared experience versus allowing them to express it. That's one of the ways that you cut off a conversation, you destroy the loop, and you get people to turn off and they want to run away. But one of the big mistakes that salespeople make because they're afraid. They're afraid that if I say, man, Johnny, sounds like that's really important to you. And Johnny comes back and says, not really, that all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I just got rejected. Like they think that's rejection. So they don't go poke, don't go poke at it. And there's a, this, is a, this is not the best analogy, but there's a, there was a, an English general who basically was talking about in war, right? If, you're, if, you're, if you've got a bayonet, your job is to poke and poke and poke until you find something soft, right? So when I'm in a conversation with someone, I'm poking with questions until I find something soft. The soft is the emotion. And what I want to do is I want to find where they're emotional about things. And if I hit a dead end, they go, no, it's not really. I just, I just move, keep moving. They don't even notice that. All they know is that I care enough to ask. And if they say no, but if your brain gets in the way and you go, oh, my God, they rejected me, then you go back to all these surface questions, interrogating, as you said, and, and, and you lose. But if you poke and they go and, and you see it, like I love what you say. You see it on their face or you hear it in their tone of voice. This is what I mean by listening with your heart. And you go, hmm that sounds like it's important to you. And you just shut up and then they start talking. Then they start telling you what's really important to them. Then they start getting below the surface. And this is when you start triggering something called the self-disclosure loop. And that is when they start getting essentially a dopamine hit to the pleasure center of the brain for telling you things that they didn't want to tell you, things that they wanted to hide. By the way, on a job interview, like if you're interviewing people, if you want to find out you got the wrong candidate, make that move. Stop talking and start listening. If you're on a date and you want to find out whether or not the person that you're having a conversation with is going to be your psycho ex-wife or psycho ex-spouse you know, at some point down the road, ask questions and listen because they'll begin to tell you below the surface all the things that you need to know about them before you go on the next date. So I think that, I think, AG, what you said was brilliant. And by the way, really hard for people, hard for people to get below the surface, poke for those soft places, and then when they see something emotional, step into it. And Johnny, I want to I play this out for a moment before I move on to a, a, a I want to start like talking about a few influence frameworks, but this idea of why people are afraid to be in a conversation and get the other person to start getting emotional, telling them about their feelings, dropping below the surface. Why does that unnerve people so badly? And then they, and they quit or they abandon a string of conversation instead of sticking with it. Well, vulnerability is always a risk and it's an always a risk because we don't there on the other side of disclosing our vulnerability. We, there is uncertainty there. And if, if you're going to discuss something with somebody and it's going to get emotional, you either have to go with them into that cave in order for them. And I use that a cave analogy, which I'll set up in a, in a minute uh, for that person to feel comfortable to continue moving through this cave of vulnerability so that they're opening up. You're learning about them. You can be obsessed with the prospect. So and, and I'll set this, this analogy up so people can have this picture in their mind. If I meet you at a networking event and I want to get to know you to see if, if we can work together or whatnot, and I need to build a connection here, I meet you and we are walking, we're walking in the forest. We meet, we're, and I ask you a question, you ask me a question, and we've kept it surface level. And now I've decided that Jeb is a really cool guy and I want to build a bit of a connection so that 
we can have a meeting after this, maybe next week, all right? So as we're walking, we come to a cave. This cave is the, what I like to call the cave of vulnerability. And as I get up there and I ask you now a vertical question rather than a horizontal question, one that goes laterally, I'm going to now go deeper. I'm going to be, I'm asking you, Jeb, I know we've just met, and I know we had some laughs, but I'm going to need you to get in this cave. <laughs> and now you're like, uh, I don't, why do you want me to go in this cave? Listen, I, you don't need to know about that. Just get in. <laughs> right? And so you're like, I don't feel very good about this. I don't know you. I don't feel safe going into that cave. No. So I have to become vulnerable and I need to answer possibly sometimes my own question and walk into that cave, shine a flashlight around and go, it's come on. What are you waiting for? And you're like, Oh, it just looks pretty safe. So now you're going to follow in at disclosing your own vulnerabilities. And now we're in the cave where, and we can go as deep as we allow ourselves to go, but we've walked in there together and it's only going to work that way. Another visualization that you can use with this is Brene Brown's jelly bean jar between the both of us. And if I ask you a question and I'm asking you to be vulnerable, maybe you throw a jelly bean in and then I ask you another question of vulnerability and maybe you answer that and you throw another one and you notice I'm throwing all the jelly beans in the jar. This guy hasn't thrown any in. It's only going to be a matter of time before you take your jelly beans and, and go home. I, I'm going to have to contribute to this to make it even for you to feel as if I'm contributing enough to want you to throw in another jelly bean. This is where with the conversation, the interaction, the interplay is back and forth. There's a volley going on. And for salespeople, they're so worried about having control all the time of the conversation that needs to be my frame. I can't allow this conversation to be derailed. But you also know that there needs to be some, some enough for the frame to be twisted, to be manipulated a bit, but you boundaries to hold it on track. If you, if you make the conversation stiff, or ha need to have control over all the time, the other person is going to feel that it's inauthentic because conversations don't work that way. So you just articulated a frame that we teach called dual process. Very, very hard. Like when we go back to art, okay, so art is difficult. It's practiced. You learn. And this, this, this concept of dual process, very difficult. Dual process is the ability to be outcome-focused, and empathetic at the same time. And this is where when you see a sales conversation that is truly artwork happens. Like Johnny, you just said, you twist the frame. This is, this is because really good salespeople, really good conversationalists, they understand the outcome. Now, if you're at a party and you're having a conversation with someone, there's not an outcome. But if you're a right. networking event, if you're in sales, even if you're on a date, right? If you're in those situations, there's a defined outcome. There's a yes, targeted there next step, right? So so you have to let go of the need to just always mm -hmm. run in one linear direction toward the outcome so that you can be organic in the conversation. This allows you, by the way, to ask fewer questions, get more information. As you say, go into the vulnerability cave with them. I love that. And and poke around in the cave to see where there's opportunity and then pull that back into based on all the things that we learned about each other in this situation, passing the jelly bean jar back and forth, then I think that it makes sense for us to go here next. That's difficult for people because, first of all, that's, not, that's a learned skill. It's not easy. I mean, there are a few people who are savants who have that naturally, and they just walk into that with talent, but most of us don't. So you've got to be able to start thinking about the world with both an outcome-driven focus and an empathetic focus. Now, empathy is a meta skill in sales, but if we look at statistically across sales calls, across you know thousands and thousands of sales calls, salespeople who are more outcome-driven typically are going to get better outcomes statistically long-term, with one exception. As the complexity of the relationship goes up, empathy builds and becomes a much bigger 
a bigger part of the conversation. And because most sales are transactional versus versus complex, in the con- in a transactional sale, door to door, you want to buy my you know my vacuum cleaner. Right. We don't do that anymore. But in that case, empathy doesn't really matter that much, right? It's just do you want to buy? Do you want to buy? Do you want to buy? So when I look at salespeople overall, and when I'm coaching coaches to coach salespeople, and I want you to talk about a little bit of this, AJ, as I as I walk you through this is that everybody fits on the empathy scale someplace. Some of us are more self-centered. I'm one of those people. I'm probably a three, right? Next to three is two, that'd be narcissistic. And next to two is a one, which would be a sociopath, right? All the way up to a 10, which would be hyper-empathic, which is the human being that can feel the vibration of trees. I mean, they spend most of their time crying, right? So these people should never be in sales and really should probably be in a dark room someplace. I call them pathologically compassionate. There you go. That would be, I love that. That's a much better way of saying it. But, but in between, right, most of us function between say three and eight. And in that space, we have to learn if we're outcome driven to be intentional about empathy. So I have to walk into a conversation and tell myself before I go in, here's what I'm going to do. I have to have that little sticky note that you got on your computer screen that says, wait, I need to have that in front of me to force myself to remember that my job is empathy so I can be organic in the conversation. And when I'm dealing with empathetic people, and you can imagine this, for example, with someone who comes to you, and just, let's just take, talk about in their personal relationships. Like they, they might even say this to you, AJ. They might say, my personal relationships are going nowhere. Like I go on all these dates, but I never get anywhere next. Or salespeople who say, I'm not closing any business. I go on all these sales calls, but nothing is advancing. I mean, literally, it's the sim- it's a sa- same conversation. They're so empathetic that when they get to the point where they need to ask for the next step, so they're really good at the conversation. And Johnny, they're they're like brilliant at bending the frame. Like they'll they'll I mean they'll twist the damn frame. But then there's this place where they got to ask for the next step, and they're everything inside of them is screaming. They're not going to like me if I ask. They're not going to like me with ask. Not really realizing that they earned it. Like you earned they the earned right. It. Like they love you now because you spent the time listening to them. We have to teach them. Before they walk in, they have to they have to like get right with God. This is what I'm going to ask for at the end. So AJ, what I want you to walk me through is, are those frames valid? Valid if we talk about those two things, and what do you do as a coach to help people, no matter where they are on that empathy scale? We are who we are as human beings. Like we we have to flex our communication style to other people. How do you help people through practice, through coaching, through skill development? to be able to do both of those things at the same time, outcome and empathy inside of an organic conversation. And as Johnny says, we're bending the frames all over the place so that we're flexing to the person and we're jumping into the vulnerability cave. Well, what happens between those two is called tension. And the problem we fall in is many of us are afraid of tension. We don't want that tension and pressure. And you hear this from a lot of people who start in sales, right? The yes ladder. I don't want to hear a no. I don't (laughs) want to be in conflict. I don't want there to be tension. I want this to be smooth sailing. I want people to like me. I want people to just be attracted to me. Tension is a good thing, whether it's sexual tension, whether it's tension in the call. I don't know if I'm a good fit for this program. I hope I am. I hope AJ likes me. That tension is a good thing. It actually draws people in. And we want to maintain that tension throughout that conversation because that's what's going to make us stand out. And those who are really adept at communication and adept at sales understand that that tension is good and thrive in that tension. So, yes, we're always going to have opposing points that we have to work through, but that's the balance of life. So understanding if where you fall on that, number one. So I like what you said earlier around – you know, the micro expressions and being on video. The best way I like to explain this is if you're in a relationship, dating or with your spouse, and you've been out somewhere, you've been separated, you can just look at that person, or maybe it's your best friend, across the room without saying anything. And both of you will nod and know it's time to go, right? You didn't have a conversation. You didn't text. You didn't come over and talk about it. But you just know because you are now so adept at reading that person's micro expressions, picking up and signaling with your own micro expressions that now's the time. We practice this in our course through video work and through repetition so that we're tuning ourselves into those signals. And a good salesperson is someone who looks for these signals in every conversation so that when they're in, 
the tension and pressure of a sales call, they can pick up on it and then use that tension to their advantage, right? So it's, as we say, bending the frame is creating tension. That's all we're doing. We, we're now flexing a little bit in the other way, and the other person is like, well, maybe I'm not a good fit for the Art of Charm program. I have to really demonstrate why I'd be a great fit for their coaching program. That's more likely to lead to a sale than them feeling like, wow, AJ's really agreeable. AJ's so likable. Like, man, I really love talking to AJ. How many of you in the sales experience have had great calls, great conversations where you think you really know the person, but they didn't buy? They didn't buy because there's no tension. You alleviated all that tension. You removed it because you wanted to be likable. So it's practice, it's repetition, but it's tuning yourself to the right signals and understanding at a deep level that tension is good. And we hear this from clients who are like, man, I'm, I don't get second dates. I'm in the friend zone. You didn't create any tension. You let them know exactly what your attentions were. You maybe were too blunt saying, I really need this. I really want this. I have to see you again. And there's no tension there. But we crave tension. We don't go to movies and just sit there and, and watch the movie happen with no lightning and flash and bangs. And now, obviously, with Marvel movies being so popular, that entire movie start to finish is tension. What's going to happen next? I don't know. I have to keep watching. So that mindset of understanding tension is good and mastering that tension through practice, repetition, and tuning into the right signals is exactly how we get there. Now, folks, this is what you call synchronicity. When AJ just completely sets up the next segment without even knowing that he's setting up the next segment, tension. So I want to end with the greatest leverage, the greatest move, the, the most powerful frame or technique in sales. By the way, in relationships, we set this up by talking about the most insatiable human need, the need to feel like you matter. And when we, when we make people feel like they matter, the easiest way to do that is to listen to them. Then we give them the greatest gift that you can give another human being. That, in turn, creates the need to reciprocate. So in the other person, it's the law of rec reciprocity. And so when I'm asking them, and this is what's happening in the sales call, I'm asking for a series of commitments. When I'm asking them for the next commitment, they're more likely, I've been probability in my favor that they say yes, because they feel an obligation to do something for me because I made them feel so doggone good because we jumped in the vulnerability cave together and I acknowledged them and validated them. But that's not always the thing that's going to work. What you said, AJ, is that man, people want what they can't have. Like This is why people run from things that chase them. So when you say, oh, God, I really, really need this relationship, or even if you're just saying it through your body language, like I really need this sale, or you're desperate, I call this the universal law of need, right? The more you need the win, the more you need the date, the more you need this, the less likely you are to get it. And by the way, if you do get it, the more you're willing to give away in order to have it. So people want what they can't have. And what we want to do is create the tension of getting them to lean into you. And this, by the way, is an outcome-driven focus. And that is being able to say things like this. You know, Johnny, not everybody is a good fit for sales gravy. You know, this is not always the right thing. Or being able to, to say, you know, why don't you go think about it? I did this to a CEO the other day ago who said, all right, close me. And I said, I'm not going to close you. So this is a big decision you need to make. And this is a, a, a huge commitment from my consulting organization to come into your organization and rebuild your entire training program. So what I want you to do is go back and think about why you're willing to step into this and make those commitments and then let me know if you believe it's the right fit for you. And I mean, you would have right. like, the look on his face was like, I bet. like, I mean, they start selling me. What do you mean I'm not the right fit? So, so <laughs> this is called the takeaway. It is powerful. And when you learn how to use it both in subtle ways, you know, I'm not really sure this can be a right fit. Or I'll say at the beginning of a call, you know, what we're going to do is explore this together. And then, like, we know this is not the right fit for everybody. From there, you and I, Johnny, we can make a decision together whether or not it makes sense for us to move to the next step. F from just a pure takeaway, well, I'll say somebody's asking me about, you know, how much does it cost for this or what will it cost to get you on stage? I'll say, I you know, gonna say. look, here's the deal. <laughs> we're probably not the right fit for you. What do you mean we're not the right fit for you? Well, I mean, if you're worried about how much it's going to cost, 
we're focusing on the wrong thing. I mean, do you, do you want an impact, right? Or do you want cost savings? If it's cost savings, I got somebody that can do that for you really, really cheap. Right? <laughs> if you want impact, then let's talk about how we put a program together that's going to be the right fit for your audience. And then we can come back and work on the economics. And, and I think that this is when we, we started off about chasing. A lot of people chase versus flip the script essentially and get people coming back to them. So Johnny, I want to end with this powerful technique and, and even, by the way, silence, right? Just silence is a form of takeaway. Like, I'm not going to fill the silence in. I'm going to wait for you to do that. Let's talk about this technique. How do people build and grow the emotional discipline to leverage the takeaway in a way that does not come off as arrogant, right? It's authentic, and it's nuanced. And the person's brain doesn't even know what happened to them. I mean, they're so, like, they're just like, boom, right? And then... They just magically do all the work for you. How do you yep. learn how to do that? It is a process in which you have to build up your own life because if it's, I don't think it's something that you can effectively fake. I think you, if you fake out, if you try to fake 10 people, maybe you'll fake one out. But it, but to do it authentically, your life has to be built up to a place where you are more concerned about what you have going on and whether or not this person, if they come in, would be a good fit to be adding to it rather than taking away or setting up uh, hindrances in your life. And if you've taken the care to build up your life, you're naturally going to be testing people. You're naturally going to be telling them, in, in whether it's your body language, whether it's your tonality, whether it's the words that you use or the context in which you set this up, that they know that you are discerning, that you are testing them, that you are seeing whether or not it's, a, it's going to be a fit. That tension goes a long way in sort of muddying the waters for them not to be clear in what's going on. All they know is they feel good in your presence. They want more of that. And this person now is sending signals that is saying that perhaps they can't well, I got to fix that. I need to, I, I need to show them that I, I am. So you, that's where it effectively puts them in a position to show their value because you've given them value and, and now they're not unsure of how you feel about them. Why? Because you're so, you already have discernment because you're protecting something that you have built yourself. This is why for so many young guys who let's talk about, you know, 18, 19 years old who write us and say, I need a girlfriend. I can't figure it out. It, we have those young guys, of course, who are going to be like, Hey, can you guys help me out here? And it's always the same. I was, I was 17, 18 years old. That's sometimes that's the only thing that you can think about because that's the way you're programmed. That's the way you've, you've been made. That's the driver of our civilization. And, and it's so if that, that was to tell somebody, listen, you're really young. You need to be building up your life and get your things going on and quit worrying about girls. That that is not something that an 18 year old kid wants to hear. Okay. Well, here's a bunch of, there's two factors that I want to point out in, in this exact thing. The first is abundance versus scarcity. So you are at a place where you can tell that CEO, why don't you think about it? Because you're already coming from a place of abundance. If you're in a place of scarcity, then you have to rely on discipline because you will chase unless you are implementing discipline in your life. This is the marshmallow test. Leave a marshmallow in front of a young kid and see if they can delay gratification, if they could wait till you come back in the room to eat that marshmallow. Unfortunately, we live in a society where we get everything we want at the touch of a button. There is no longer waiting. There's no delayed gratification at all. But those who are successful, and we've had tons of successful people on our podcast, practice self-discipline in other areas of their life. So they can control those emotions. So even if they're not in abundance, Right? It's a much easier decision to, to play hardball, to get someone else to chase when you have plenty of options. When you're that guy who's got tons of options in his Tinder inbox, when you're that salesperson who has a full pipeline of leads and can hang up the call and pick up another call. 
But if you're not, if you are in a place of scarcity, you have to practice self-discipline in other areas of your life, whether that's diet, whether that's exercise, whether that's habit building, whether that's morning routine, evening routine, cold showers, whatever the case may be. Because in those moments of scarcity, we are hardwired to chase, yep. to survive. Yep. And it is so much easier. That's the problem that I have with most advice out there is it's people who are already in a place of abundance talking about abundant mindset. But if you are in a place of scarcity, you have to start with discipline. You can't possibly start from abundance. You're not feeling abundance. Your wallet is hurting. You don't have any Tinder matches. You just moved to a new town. You don't have any friends. You don't have a network. So what do you have to do to build yourself up? Self-discipline, delayed gratification. Understand that the next opportunity is around the corner, even if it doesn't feel like it right now. And, and anything be- that you're trying to build in your own life, you get focused there and you create more opportunities. You're creating abundance. Yeah. And let's be clear what discipline is. Cause I, this was, that was a, like, we're going to have to cut that out and just post that by itself. Cause that was powerful, powerful, powerful. So discipline is sacrificing what you want now for what you want most. That's what it is. And there are five core disciplines, especially in sales, that you have to master in order to be great at sales. And, and I love what you said. A lot of the advice is coming from people who have abundance. And I've run my life with abundance. Like everything that I do is making sure that I am never in a situation where I have scarcity and I have to feel like I have to chase, which was really, really, really hard when I started this company 13 years ago. And it's just me and flip flops on the phone calling people and saying, hey, you want to hire me? I mean, you know, that's a very, very difficult place to be. But it's, it's pipeline discipline. you got to begin there. And all the advice that I can give anyone is, look, the best way I can teach you emotional discipline is fill up your pipeline. you got to start at that place. But you can have the discipline to pick up the phone. You can have the discipline to make one more call. You can have the discipline to get up every day and prospect every day, every day, every day, every day. You can do that because you can control your actions, right? You, it's emotional discipline. And emotional discipline is tough because we've all been in that situation where we feel like, the ship that's being tossed around or analogy that you guys used the last time we were together is that you feel like your alter ego, your emotion is at the wheel of the car and you're sitting in the back seat and it's driving you everywhere. That can happen, but you can start focusing on what you can do. And I love what you said, focus on other parts of your life where you feel like you have control, like your fitness or your food or, or just like, for example, I was in a situation one time where I had an empty pipeline. I I would stop and read this book. Like I would read a book on how to get more discipline. And that gave me some sense of control that I had that. So you've got, you've got pipeline discipline. You've got time discipline. Time discipline matters, right? You get to choose what you're going to do every moment of your day. You have complete control over that. You think you don't, but you do. So you've got emotional discipline. That is emotional intelligence. That's hard. And then there's, there's people discipline, right? So you've got to learn how to deal with people. What we've been teaching you here are frameworks. Human beings are incredibly predictable. Once you understand how human beings work and you have the emotional discipline to run the plays, people will typically fall in line and they'll do the things that they're supposed to do. And then finally, there's probability discipline. And that's where everything comes together for me. Every move I make on the sales chessboard and on the life chessboard is based on what's the probability that this move is going to get me the outcome that I desire. Very rarely is it 100%. But I don't make low probability moves. And a lot of salespeople, when they hit that desperate space, that desperate state, they run that. So I know that when I'm using the takeaway in a sincere, authentic way, and I'm using it from a place of emotional discipline, that I have a very high probability of the person leaning into that. I get that. And I understand all of those moves. And, and once we get that and we understand this whole concept of discipline, sacrificing what you want now for what you want most... And then running these systems and frames, these, these things that AJ and Johnny will teach you in their coaching courses, once you get this, then you become a powerful influencer, you become a persuader, you become charming, and you become charismatic, and you become a human being that other people almost can't help being around. Like they, they're, they're attracted to you. Now, I've got one more thing I want to end with because you said something earlier, Johnny, that was important to me, and I, and I, I don't want to lose it. And this, this, this is a, a play on what you said, AJ. A lot of the advice that you get from people comes from a place of abundance. Like, you know, it's like some guy telling you, like, you can get on LinkedIn and you can make all this money. And 
they've already they've spent 15 years doing that. Or you can have a successful podcast. And AJ and Johnny have been doing this for 15 years. You know, I've, I've been podcasting since 2007. Trust me, today, you're not going to get the audience that I've got or you've got starting fresh. I mean, unless you've got a lot of money to spend on advertising, but you're not going to do that. you got to work at this and grind at this. But some, sometimes there are, there are parts of our life that we're just not good at. You said, Johnny, you're in a conversation with someone and, you know, you're, you're, I think maybe AJ, maybe you said this, but you're, you're thinking about the next witty thing that you're going to say. Some people are really good at coming up with witty things. I've got friends like that. Like you say something and the next thing out of their mouth, they say something and everybody's laughing. I'm like, how the hell do you do that? I don't do that. I'm not good at it. And when I try to do it, it doesn't always come off very well. Like if I try to come up with something witty at the wrong time, it lands flat. And what I've learned is not to do that. Like I don't try to like, <laughs> I don't try to ad lib any type of humor. I'm just not good at it. What do you say for people who that's their model? Like they're in conversations with people, whether they're salespeople, I've watched salespeople who do that. What's what's the what's the value in learning how to be charming, but also be who you are, like be yourself. And I want to end with this and I'm going to give you both a shot at this, uh -huh. at this process, because I know that when you got like you were talking about the 18, 19 year old people, they're, they're almost asking you, can you turn me into a different person? And I, I'm not sure that's the right message for people. I think that people really value authenticity and you got to be like grounded in who you really are. So go Johnny. Well, comedy, much like music that we're talking about, or even in cells, it's a skill. And for some people, they're born with it. They're, they're quite hilarious. They always got the right thing to say. And, the, and they are some funny people. Also, uh, humor, it, much like our diet, it, we all have different tastes. So who's funny in, in one crowd? We see it culturally today. Isn't funny in another crowd? In fact, quite offensive. So you have to be careful with that. Regardless of that, is there a way that you can develop that or allow yourself to learn humor and bring it out of you? Give yourself an opportunity to get better with it? Absolutely. You could do that through watching some com comedians on YouTube and learn about timing and things. However, I would say, and we put this in our classrooms because it is the most effective way that we have learned people to not only learn humor, that's a side of it, but also get more comfortable with who they are as a person and bring out their authentic self. Because if you are allowed to bring out your authentic self, there's going to be parts of that that people are going to find very funny and we tell all of our folks we've implemented this in our virtual classes we've put this into our live training programs and anyone can do this from anywhere there is improv in every city in every town uh, in the west and it is designed to allow you to drop your guard be authentic and just open up and speak. And the more you get to practice that, the better you get at that. And you learn about what uh, your sense of humor is and timing. Because remember, as I mentioned earlier today, that when you're under tension and pressure, you're, you're reduced to the level of your training. Sales, networking, these are all tension dates, tension-filled situations. So if you want to be better under pressure, you have to find those opportunities to put yourself under pressure and work through it. Improv gives you an open forum of, of no judgment to just fly on the, by the seat of your pants and work on communication skills in a tension, stress-filled uh, situation. Yes, and AJ. <laughs> well, I want to <laughs> use a term that you throw around a lot that I really love, which is bend the probability in your favor. Authenticity does just that, but it's not 100%. Hmm. I'm willing to bet your close rate is not 100%. We know from athletes, winning percentages are not 100%. The pursuit of perfection gets in the way of authenticity. So being authentic is bending the probability in your favor. It's understanding that the best version of you is the most of you, not less of you, not guarded, not putting that governor up or that shell or analyzing what you're going to say 
And what improv shows you is that you can be authentically funny by simply saying what's on your mind. Yep. Because our mind is in sync with our audience most of the time. Unless you really don't have much human interaction, which I don't think many in your audience who are going to be listening to this are in that place, you will sync with others because it is hardwired in our DNA for survival to be a part of community. And your brain is, is catching all of these signals around humor. It's just if you haven't practiced it, as Johnny said, or been in an environment where that's accepted and you can work through that and create new pathways, neuroplasticity in your mind, then you are going to be self-critical. You are going to put forward a fake version of yourself, an inauthentic guarded version of yourself that is going to bend the probability the other way. I can't trust this person. I don't want to do business with this person. I can't give them my money. I don't want to go on a date with them. So authenticity bends the probability of likability of relationships in your favor, but it's not 100%. And that's okay too. You know, our business coach said one of the most powerful lessons he got was a session he had with Tony Robbins, where Tony Robbins said, 50% of the population hates me, despises me. Now, this is Tony Robbins. And you look and you're like, this is a, a charismatic leader who probably thinks really highly of himself, is very confident. And here he is admitting that half of the world hates him. And he's okay with that because he's being his authentic self. We have to get okay with. There are going to be prospects that don't want to do business with us. There are going to be people that don't want to go on a second date with us. There are going to be people who don't want to promote us at work, and that's okay. It's more important to find your people, your 50% that like you, by being authentic, bending the probability in your favor doing so. Wonderful. AJ and Johnny, the art of charm. So if you want to learn more about AJ and Johnny, I believe that it is theartofcharm.com. And you can go, go to the Art of Charm podcast anywhere, Spotify, iTunes. It's an amazing podcast. It's totally worth listening to. If you want to learn how to deal with other human beings, I love this podcast. And these guys offer some amazing training and coaching programs that you want to go check out because if you're trying to up your skill to level up so that you can you can sell more, build better relationships, and be more confident, and frankly, just be happier and more content because because you feel like you're making an impact, like you're leaving people, as AJ said earlier, with a positive a positive feeling about you, then you're going to go going to want to go check out all of the things that they offer. I've been there on their website is fantastic. And maybe one of these days we'll get you guys back on. In fact, I'd like to get you back on uh, sooner than later. Cause I really enjoyed this conversation. I could have done this for two hours. It was fantastic. And speaking of authenticity, if you want to show prospects, your authentic self, go check out Vidyard. It's the one of the ways that we connect with prospects, the best prospects, the hardest to reach prospects by shooting short videos of ourselves talking, Talking with them, they can see us. It's not just a person over the phone, it's a face with a name. And you can get a free account that's free, free, free forever if you go to vidyard.salesgravy.com. That's vidyard.salesgravy.com. Join us next time on the Sales Gravy Podcast.